Welcome to the Uncut Podcast. I'm Pastor Luke, and I'm here with Pastor Cameron. And uh, this is the podcast where we try to sit down, have honest conversations about life, faith, ministry, um, theology, all of the things, and try and be as uncut and honest and kind of just off the cuff as we kind of can be. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about uh, discerning God's will. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to kind of introduce a uh, what we hope to be a reoccurring sort of aspect of the show on occasion that we feel like just can in- inject a little bit of fun, some spontaneity, um, and that is uh, just some honest reaction to content concerning just about anything we find interesting. Um, so It's going to be a little bit about like... How can I get the other person to? How are they going to react to this thing that I'm going to? Yeah, show them? yeah. I feel like this is a pretty mild. Like there was, there's definitely. I've I've got a backlog of things now. Um, I I get on in social media just to look for things to have them oh, react fun. to. Um, <laughs> but we've got this one thing. This is a pretty mild. But I thought it was like you know what? This will sponsor an interesting conversation. I think that maybe other people will find interesting. Mm-hmm. But so. Um, this is a this is a reel or a TikTok. This is you know you know I don't ascribe anything particularly negative to this individual. I you know, but I'm interested in how you would respond to to this guy's kind of message and tone. It's like when people call their pastor by their first name. I hate that. I hate when people disrespect authority like that. I'm gonna have a aneurysm just sitting here. They're not your bro. They're not your buddy. It's such a problem. This is not your bro. This is your pastor. Treat your pastor like your pastor and your bro like your bro. So what's your uh, honest reaction to that, Cameron? Uh, you know, I would say like my, my kind of my default is that I would say first, like I, I certainly don't mind people calling me by my first name. That is, yeah. after all, my name, right? Right. Um, and there are, and normally, like in conversation with people, I will, I will just tell people, like I, will, like in the context of church, I won't introduce myself as, oh, like if a new person were coming in to kind of do it, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think I ever really, honestly, introduce myself as. Pastor Cameron. Right. Um, and I think part of it is part of it maybe is a little bit like um, like I kind of I kind of want to get a congregant reaction. Like kind of like we're doing now. Like how would Cameron react to this or how does Luke react to this? But like how does the congregant, how does the person react to right, okay, they walk in I introduce myself as Cameron. Nice to mm-hmm. meet you. Glad you're here. You know. Because people react differently if you walk up to them and say, Hi, I'm Cameron, versus hi, I'm Pastor Cameron. Right. Right. Or I'm Pastor Luke. Right. They're gonna immediately gonna the conversation will right. unfold very differently. The whole demeanor changes and the whole like yeah, the whole interaction just is is different. And so I've not not intentionally so not like it's not like i have some like oh i'm i'm taking this like really philosophical approach to not saying my title um because that's what it is if, the, if for me it's a title mm-hmm. um what and it's not it's not based on philosophy in as much as it is just on like my preference and my comfort yeah. level um but i think there is something to say like that guy is his his issue was that okay well I'm I'm assuming that his issue was that pastors um, the role that they have or the calling that they have is is something to be respected is something to be honored mm-hmm. is maybe something to be revered and so because it is as such then we should give them the honor and the calling presumes upon them yeah and i don't there's a part of me that's like i receive that Mm -hmm. and i respect that and i think it's true like in most cases 
if I'm introducing someone to you, mm-hmm. I introduce you as Pastor Luke. Yeah, that's true. That is how I think we do that. And I think most of the time you do the same mm-hmm. in reverse or like yeah. another pastor or another colleague, like if I'm sitting in Starbucks with someone and, you know, right. Pastor Mark walks in right. and say, hey, this is Pastor Mark rather than, hey, that's Mark. Yeah. You know, um, so I, I think but, there's a little bit of self-deference that has to happen mm-hmm. if you're going to say like, no, you know, calling me pastor is not required. Yeah. I, I mean, like I like again, like I said, like I think there is maybe something to kind of what he's getting at. Like mm-hmm. I feel honestly very humble when people call me Pastor Luke yeah. because I'm like it. It is a consistent humbling reminder, that, reminder yeah. that of my responsibility and mm-hmm. what I'm supposed to be doing. It doesn't. Um, it so for me, I think it it. it I hear it more of a weight than I hear it as, as an elevation. Mm-hmm. I hear it more. I hear more of the duty or more of the responsibility mm-hmm. I bear, mm-hmm. less of like a honor of air of respect. I think that's in there too. Yeah. But like, so that's kind of how I, at least I receive it. But I definitely don't have like. So I appreciate when people do call me Pastor Luke, but I have zero expectation, and in. I would say probably in 90 to 80% of my interactions would prefer to just be called Luke. Luke. Yeah. I think there's a difference between someone demanding yeah. that they be, that they be referred to as pastor and someone receiving the receiving the, like, I guess you could say honor or like you said, like being reminded of the weight of the office or the calling that mm-hmm. they're has. I'll be honest, like part of it for me is about how I s- still see myself. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like a, there's a little bit of like introspection that happens there. And even though like I'm going on like almost two decades as being a pastor vocationally, like it's been my life for almost half my life now. Mm-hmm. Um, there is this sense where, I'll still wake up in the, you know, wake up in the proverbial morning sometimes and be like, I don't feel like a pastor. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't feel like I am a person that is, um, that is, I guess, worthy of being revered or honored in a way that like would lead someone to, um, refer to me by a title rather than just who I am as a person, because I just feel like I'm Cameron, right? And I just happen to have the role and the calling. Yes, the there calling was, as a pastor. There was no transfiguration that happened when you got handed your ministry degree. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah. there was like no magic moment. You know, like when when you finish school, or even when you get your first. When you know, I was appointed to my first church. Like, yeah, yeah I I was a pastor then, but. Mm-hmm. It, you know, I, like I, I still, I still struggle under the weight of like, I, if sometimes I wonder if like, if people knew how normal, normal we both are yeah. human, yeah. how, how much like my own relationship with Jesus is a constant evolution of growth and mm-hmm. change and like valleys and mountaintops rather than just like it's not just like this ascent into glory all the time right i think that's part of what keeps keeps a little bit of humility in like demanding or even wanting that title because Mm -hmm. it you're right it is like it's a constant reminder of who the lord has called us to be Mm -hmm. and sometimes and that that reminder is always I'm, i'm grateful for that calling but it is also, you know, like it is the the responsibility, the weight of the responsibility of it easily crushes. Yeah. Yeah. There's like, you know, when people find out when I'm meeting and greeting people outside of a church context, you know, and small talk, it's like the third question everybody asks is like, what do you do for a living? Right. 
Yeah, it's almost, I mean, like, in my experience, like, one of, besides first. your name, yeah, it's the first thing. Yeah. What do you do for a living? What do you do for a living? And it is, like, you know, it's just like, well, I'm, I'm a pastor. And then, like, yeah. immediately they begin to, like, not everybody, but sometimes certain people will begin to apologize for every curse word they just dropped. Yep. Um, they will begin to say, like, Oh, you know, like they, they begin to give me all the reasons why they haven't been to church in the last right. like, decade. Uh-huh. And I'm like, hey, hey man, like that's between you and God. Like, I'm, right. I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm the conviction you need, but like yeah. I don't care. <laughs> like right. I care, but I don't care. Right. Like yeah. Yeah. um it changes. It does. It so changes the way that people interact with you. And it changes their, I think, their vulnerability mm-hmm. and their honesty and their openness. And if there's like, I, I want to, I want to be the type of pastor who meets people in the midst of their vulnerability in their real life and who offers them like hope for their real situations without offering a bunch of like spiritual placations or cliches or anything like that. And so I would much rather prefer have a relationship where that's Cameron. I'm so-and-so. He has the title of pastor, but he's, he's one person in a community of faith Mm -hmm. that just happens to be like, you know, he, he's, he's, he's leading it. Right. Cause man, oh my gosh, we could talk, I could talk so much about just the, the immense feeling of like insecurity, even of that, like. Like people, wait, wait a second. Like, no, people are, people look to me as their spiritual leader. Like, Lord Jesus, please help me. Because yeah. that, that there's, with, without that, like, we're all in deep doo-doo, mm-hmm. if that's the case. Yeah, there's, I almost feel obligated to convince people that I'm normal. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, like, hey, we can just laugh too. Mm-hmm. Like we don't have to immediately start talking about like theology. Like, right. Although I do have a pretty limited scope of topics I'm interested in. I do have a few that are outside right. of my mm-hmm. position as pastor, but um, it, it is definitely like a, we feel like normal people. Or at least I feel like a normal person for the most part. To myself, I feel like a normal person. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's hard to see. It's hard to know how other people actually, like, yeah, really look at us and yeah. view us. I hope they view us as normal. I want to be viewed as normal because, um, newsflash, I am. Right. Well, one of the things that's happened occasionally, I won't say it's happened a ton, but occasionally I'll have a conversation with somebody and, you know, and then they'll, like, we'll have, like, a good moment together or whatever, and they're like, oh, there you are, Pastor Luke. Like, mm-hmm. that's you being a pastor. I'm just like, mm-hmm. honestly, I think I would have said or done those things whether or not I was a pastor. Yeah. Like, like I'm, I think I'm just being a human, just yeah. being a caring individual. Yeah. Like, I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't thinking, oh, I need to be Pastor Luke. What's the, what's the thing that I need to say? I was just like, what's, what's the thing to, to say or to be, how to be a friend to this person? Mm-hmm. Not, not necessarily thinking in this sort of grand. I think that's the better version of what I sometimes experience with people, which is, which maybe I'll do something or say something. And they'll be like, oh, geez, I wouldn't expect a pastor to do that. <laughs> I would expect to like, I can't believe you just said that. I can't believe you do that. Like, yeah. but you have tattoos, like you do jujitsu or you like, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be, you know, but it really comes to, it really comes into focus. Well, some of it comes into focus with me. I, I've told you this before. I'm sure this with lots of people. It's no secret. It's like, um, you know, I do a lot of weddings or I have done a lot of weddings and it's always interesting to see. And it, it, of course it's different with how well you know the couple and yeah. how well you know, like the whole, like the guest list or whatever. Mm-hmm. But it, it's always interesting to see like where as a pastor, like I'll get seated at the reception if I go to the reception Mm -hmm. and when I get like, so if I get seated at the reception with like just a, you know, like a 
you know, like the second cousins or something like that. Um, and I'll sit down at the table and they'll all, they'll all immediately be like, no, you know, right. so there's no more drinks, no more swearing, no more jokes, like no more dancing, right? Yeah. Like they can't have any fun because now the fun sucker yeah. has sat down at the table, right? Um, and so like you can't escape it in situations like that because they just saw you officiate the wedding and they know you're the pastor, but I would prefer them to just be like, hey, this guy is like super normal. And I hope that like the way that I interact with people ends up ends up showing that like, Hey, I just am a normal person. And that's kind of how I want to be in relationship with people. And, um, I just happen to be a normal person that really, really, really wants to see you come to the relationship with Jesus. Yeah. And, um, we'll show you that other normal people have life changing relationships with Jesus as well. So, right. yeah. And I think the, the, the funny thing about, not the funny thing, but about that video, and I don't think this is the case. It doesn't sound like the way that he was talking about it. But I think if you were to run across a pastor who I actually did, um, <laughs> if you were to run across a pastor who would um, demand, demand mm. or insist or mm. find that insulting if you didn't refer to him as pastor. You ran across it here. No, not here. Oh, okay. I did, but I did mm-hmm. run into a, I was, before I took this position, I was interviewing and fairly seriously interviewing with this church. And um, some of the feedback the senior pastor gave me was that like, I had, I had gone down a run or two on like, he was like, you, you kind of lost a couple points by not calling me pastor, whatever. Mm-hmm. He was kind of, it was part of his feedback. He's like, you should just assume to call the pastor, pastor something. It was like, that was part of feedback. I asked for like some honest feedback on how I'd interviewed. Yeah. Um, because we were moving on at that point. So I appreciated the feedback. I was like, yeah, like as far as like good interviewing strategies, maybe mm-hmm. that would be a good thing for me to do is to assume and maybe refer to the pastor as pastor so and so. But I don't know if I want to work for a pastor who notices that. Right. So I don't know that I want to change that. Yeah. Well, because it's for me, it's a part of a bigger conversation, and this is a conversation that we're having here among our staff. Is what are like those delineating lines between authenticity, mm-hmm. honesty, real life, vulnerability, and professionalism? Yeah, excellence, respect, honor. Like where, at what point? Does does like the salt water and the fresh water mix? Like, what are the delineating lines there between when it's appropriate to be authentic, vulnerable, honest friends, buddies, bros, and when it's like you know respect and honor mm-hmm. and title or calling or whatever? Um, and I think that there. I do think that that you can do both. Mm -hmm. I think that you can be both professional and you can be, I guess, just informal. I know what I was to say, but yeah, not not unprofessional, but informal. Yeah. Um, But knowing, I think knowing when, when we can do that and how to do it is probably the more important thing. And it probably has more to do with, like the individual relationship that we have with a person mm-hmm. than it does a, you know, a like boilerplate, boilerplate professionalism scale that you're just going to operate on. Yeah. yeah. But let's get to the topic of today's podcast. Mm-hmm. And that is discerning God's will, Cameron. Yeah. So we were, we were even just talking about, um, you know, ministry and, and being pastors and like that kind of comes up in the like discerning calling, mm-hmm. right? Or um, it kind of comes up around major life decisions a lot of times for people of like wanting to hear the word of the Lord or the voice of the Lord mm-hmm. telling us to do X thing. 
Yeah. But even not even um, in major life decisions and even in the smaller things, sometimes it's comforting to kind of come up and talk to uh, or, or kind of have a sense of God leading us in this smaller decision. Yeah. I think the cliche that I kind of always think about this in kind of its most stereotypical and maybe straw manned form is the is the you know the young Christian man who comes up to the young Christian girl and says, mm-hmm. The Lord has told me that you are to be my wife, yeah. right? Or to be my girlfriend or that we should date or whatever. How and convenient then, for him. Yeah, very convenient. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. you know, it doesn't matter that same thing happened six months ago of somebody else. But yeah. mm-hmm. what are your kind of what what do you initially have to to kind of say to that kind of phenomena that we experience in in Christian culture? Yeah, I think that it. Um, I think there's a couple different ways to look at it. The first is you can look at it with a really like a really positive spin about everyone's desire to operate fully under or fully in the will of God, Mm -hmm. like to not do anything, not, not, not make a decision, not take a job, not date a person, not wear the wrong color shirt, not do this or do that without having a sense of like, Oh no, this is God's will Mm -hmm. in this moment, right. For this thing or for this big thing. So I think it, it, when when you talk about it from its most pure form, I, I have a sense of like, okay, that's a yeah, that's that's a thing that we should all be asking about our lives. Mm-hmm. Like, is this? Am I operating in the we like? There's a people talk about like, well, I'm kind of like, I'm in the right in the center of God's will right now, hmm. as if there's like a slightly off center. Mm-hmm. Or a slightly off, like to the left, um, and I get like the it's just it's just about language, right, yeah. and definitions and distinctiveness. But there's either like a God's will or a not God's will, mm-hmm. right? There's like a God. This is God's will, plan, desire, and I guess even talking about like God's will as like a what are we talking about when we talk about God's will, right? Like His preordained from the beginning foundations of the world every detail every you know every mm-hmm. dot every cr- crossing of the t right um it has been preordained it ha- has been predecided like in his sovereignty we need to um sift through the clues of life and discover what God has preordained for us to do in every single moment, in every single day, mm-hmm. in every single situation. Um, I think that I don't want, I, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that I think that that's dangerous, mm-hmm. but I think that it's distracting. Yeah. Well, I, I immediately, I read this book a long time ago. Um, maybe, Maybe close to ten years ago, I think I might have still been in high school when I read it. It was Kevin Kevin D Young had a book mm-hmm. on discerning the will of God mm-hmm. or something like that. He talks about this. I think it's from that book. He talks about um, like we kind of get into this idea of thinking about God's will as a tightrope, mm-hmm. right? And if I make if I and my job is to discern God's will in such a way as that I always make the right decision. Yeah. And if I do that, I stay on the tightrope. But if I make the wrong decision, I've fallen off mm-hmm. the tightrope in some way. And like there is a bit of a uh, I don't know, there can be a bit of a paralysis that people can experience. 100%. Yeah. Of you know, of of wanting to be wanting to walk that tightrope. Mm-hmm. Um find a lot of times I, I even encountered I encountered somebody who was um, making a he 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 it was a convenient I don't know that this person actually believed this this was their theological justification for their decision that they were making but they were leaving their their wife of many 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 years mm-hmm. because they had 
met someone and they're like, oh my gosh, I know this person, uh, this other woman, we went to high school together and like we, you know, da, 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 da. And they're like, this is the person that if I had followed God's will, I would have ended up with anyways. Like right. I would have, I should have dated her. We almost dated some sort of story like that. Yep. And, but I didn't for some reason. And they're the person that God intended for me. Right. And so now it is the right thing for me to do to divorce my wife, leave my family, leave yeah. my family, all mm-hmm. of the things that that person ended yeah. up doing in order to go to be with the person that they had come to this understanding that mm-hmm. was the one that God had intended originally for them to have yeah. gotten to. And that's where I think that kind of thinking of like this kind of tightrope everything being absolutely completely preordained and we can get things wrong. It's like one example, I think of where that can kind of get bad. Yeah. It can get bad. And it like, I kind of like the phrase that guides me in that, like that question when people say, well, what is, what, what is the will of God? Um, And it's actually not, it's not too difficult. I don't think, Maybe it's an oversimplification. I don't think it is, but like, say like the the will of God is the word of God. Mm-hmm. You know, so like if in your example, right? Like, does the does the does the presumed will of God that I'm pass that I'm um, chasing in this situation does it square with the word of God? Mm-hmm. So like, okay, the will of God is would have been for me to marry this woman. However, I happen to be married to this woman. So I will, without biblical reason, divorce the woman that I'm married to and go and chase after this other relationship. Right. Now, does, like, the will of God does not contradict the word of God any more than the word of God contradicts the proposed will of God, right? Right. So, like, it would be like me saying, I think that it is God's will that I go into the store and steal something today. Right. Like, I, there's just this thing that I want. It's a desire of my heart. It's God has given you some sort of superseding... Passionate, like, he's giving me a passion for this thing, for this TV. Yeah. Right, and he's like he's showed me how I could use this TV for his glory. I can invite my unsaved friends over. We can watch football together, and I can witness to them. Right? Isn't isn't witnessing to my friends the word uh, the will of God? Mm-hmm. I will go. I don't have the money for this TV, but so I'm going to go steal this TV, and I'm going to use it for God's glory. I'm like, bro, that ain't, that is not the will of God. Right now, that's a silly example. Right, but. I mean, it's but it's it's not all that much more silly than the example I gave of the actual person. The actual thing. The actual thing, mm-hmm. you know. Like, right. Right. So, you know. um, so I think that, but going back to what I started saying is like the the. I think in its like most general form, it comes from a place of wanting to, like, be. On the tightrope of God, like you said, like just right. follow every lockstep with what God is doing mm-hmm. um, or what God wants for us. Um, I, I think we then can kind of come to the question about like, okay, well then, if we – let's say we use the principle that the, the will of God is the word of God, right? Then – if we are if we are in the word and are reading the word and are digesting and like letting the word feed us, then okay, what is the like the overarching like desire or will of God for you and I in our lives? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think I think I stand on pretty strong biblical and theological ground when I would say like I think that the will of God for Cameron is that I would be. Every day, every moment, every breath conformed to the image and likeness of his son, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty clear. Yeah. And then I think that there are some really clear distinctives that you can say, this is definitively the the will of God. Mm -hmm. It's 
the will of God that I don't murder people, that yeah. I don't steal. I'm glad that you agree on those. Well, I got some skills, <laughs> so <laughs> right. <laughs> that I don't steal, that right. I don't cheat on my wife. It's yeah. the will of God that I, you know, like are loving my neighbor. Right. Right. Um, the things that Jesus taught. Right. Yeah. You know, th- those. That's the will. That's that is God's will for me in Christ Jesus mm-hmm. for sure. Right. Well, what about what job I take then? Mm. What about what what person I marry? What about um, what city I live in or move to? What about what color shirt I wear or how I cut my hair? What about X, Y, or Z? Mm-hmm. So, like, when it comes to there are there are things that are definitively and distinctively the will of God or not the will of God. And then there's this whole block of things over here where I think that we, I think that this whole block of things over here is generally where people want to have the conversation about the will of God Mm -hmm. is the things where God is like, I don't know, you choose. Yeah. Not that flippantly. Sure. But like, I think he cares. He cares, of course. But like, there's, I think he, <laughs> like God has given us freedom in aspects of our lives for a reason because he loves us and freedom is a foundational principle to the expression and receiving of love, you know? And so for me to say, well, was it the will of God that I marry Sherry, my wife? I, I don't think that if I married someone else, that God was going to be like, you sinned because mm-hmm. I wanted you to marry Sherry, right? Um, I think that, that that God was like, I I want you to be more and more like my son Jesus every day, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I can be more and more like my son Jesus if I choose to marry Sherry, or if I choose to marry this person, or I choose to marry that person, or if I have this job, or I have that job, or whatever, you know, if I wear this color shirt, that color shirt. So more about like, um, all right, is God is God clearly is God clearly saying, you know, um, you know, this is the distinctive of my will for your life, or is there like kind of this general like? I give you freedom to choose because I love you. Grace to make a wise decision. Grace to make a wise decision. Yeah. Yeah. And and I it really makes me I actually really get sad when people um when people use an opportunity for freedom to feel shame hmm. over I made a wrong decision. Let's let's say, let's say okay, that they that they were looking for a new job, okay, or a new career, right? And so, and they were asking, you know, Lord, what is your will? What is your will? What is your will? What is your will? And they were praying. They were they they earnestly and and you know wanted to know. And in most situations, I think you know, like, well, has God revealed to you that He has a will about this for you? Okay, if he has, then follow that. Or do you get a sense that, like, no, I, I don't. I'm not really kidding. Like any, any sense, like internal sense of like the, you know, the Holy Spirit isn't speaking to my heart about like, no, this is definitely like, what, you know, what you should do. Um, and so, and so, I didn't know, and I kept praying and praying. So I just, I chose the one that I thought would be the best. Had the best opportunity, was mm-hmm. the best pay, was close to my family, right. you know, had the most opportunity that I wanted to do. Yep. That matters. It matters. Like I wanted to do that thing. That would be fun and exciting or whatever. And man, I was in the job for like six months and they fired me. Mm-hmm. Or I found out I didn't like that line of work and I just couldn't take it anymore. So I quit. And like, man, I am just like, I can't. God must be so angry at me for not following his will as if like the end of something or something not working out right. was the proof yeah. that it wasn't God's will. Well, And then it just, and then the whole conversation of knowing or not knowing God's will just becomes a, 
a laboratory where shame is leveraged. Yeah. There's a presupposition there that if we follow God's will, all Everything things work, work out, out. Yes. the way we want them to. Yeah. Or all things will feel good. Yeah. Right? Like, I think one of the things that, like, we forget is that Jesus followed God's will when he went to the cross. Right? Like, God's, yeah. God's will, like, in his, like... And he actually asked God. Yeah. He actually he does, asked does the talk Father, about his will in that prayer. You know, mm-hmm. if it, you know, Lord, is this your will? Mm-hmm. If it's, you know, if there's any other way, could we do it the other way? Yeah. But if it is, if this is the way, I will go. Yeah. Right. I feel like there are so many, so many kind of like branches to this conversation we can yeah. talk about. Um, and, you know, it's definitely. There's a couple that I want to hit. One that I'm interested in. So let's talk about Gideon. Mm. Let's talk about fleeces. Mm. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> well, I'm cut. We're just gonna respond off the cuff to this. Oh my gosh. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna tell you kind of my Christians like, are so weird. Bro. We are weird, oh, right? Oh my gosh. Have you laid out a fleece? Have you it? laid out a fleece? I you know, I remember <laughs> I mean, one, like, this is, like, uh, this maybe is proof positive um, for parents. If you're wondering if your kids ever get anything out of church or remember things from church, like, I swear I remember my senior pastor from growing up, like, maybe in middle school, Mm -hmm. he was teaching on, like, Gideon. Mm -hmm. And I remember him explaining it in such a way as to explain that, like, the fleece is not an example to be emulated, was at least... His teaching on that, yeah. um, that this was an example of the lack of faith that Gideon was having, not a positive example of his faith. And it was not something to be emulated. It was there as an embarrassment to him. And so, and I, that, that is stuck in my Praise head. Praise God for that pastor. Like, But I will say that since then, I have never, ever, ever heard that teaching repeated mm. in any form surrounding the topic of mm-hmm. laying out a fleece yeah. or for those who aren't maybe who are maybe like what the heck are these two pastors talking mm-hmm. about Gideon being man of the Lord mm-hmm. was told by the Lord to do a thing to go out and lead an army and he was like Lord are you sure are you sure <laughs> and he like put out literally a fleece on the ground and like he did it Twice? Twice, yeah. Uh, once saying, let the ground be dry around it and the fleece be wet. The second night, like, let the fleece be dry and the ground around it be wet. Like, mm-hmm. you know, kind of saying, if you do this, God, I will know that you're speaking to me. Yeah. You know, so yeah. people will do that with, like, you know, God, if I get uh, a phone call from so-and-so, I will know yes. that I'm supposed to do this. Right. So let's right. talk about this. Yeah. Um. Oh, man. Yeah, I don't know. There's been a few times where... People have asked me, I remember, so I was working when I was in college, um, I was a senior, I was just about to graduate, and I was working at a church in Rochester as like, um, as basically their like adult discipleship coordinator, small mm-hmm. group coordinator, whatever. And it was about that time of my life where... I started to get the sense that the Lord wanted me to come back to Chautauqua County, not stay there, because I could have stayed and worked there. Sherry and I were about to get married. She had a job offer up there. We had an apartment offer. Like, mm-hmm. it was going to work out. It was going to be, you know, like, it could have it could have done anything. And I was just getting this, like, continued sense of, like, you know, the Lord wants me back in Chautauqua County. It was like one of those – it was like one of those times where I was mm-hmm. like, okay, yeah, there's freedom to choose where I live and what job I have, except when – you know very clearly that the Lord is saying, I have something different for you and I want you somewhere else, mm-hmm. right? And I, that was one of those moments where I was like very clearly, this is where like affirmation in my spirit from the spirit of God, mm-hmm. this is where you're, this is what you're supposed to do. So I had a friend up there. He was an older guy. He was like a, he was a, you know, he was married. He had kids. He had kind of like taken me under you know, his wing while I was up in school, he was kind of like somewhat of a father figure up there for me. And I told him and he was just, he was really disappointed because like, he didn't want me to leave the area. Like he wanted me to stay. Um, and he was like, but I have a really important question for you about like, whether or not you're hearing the Lord correctly. Have you laid out a fleece about this? (laughs) 
And again, the sentiment is, do you really know that this is what God is asking you to do? Right. Okay. Right. But then the implication is, is that there are going to be extraordinarily practical clues that you just have to discern, like God's will is some kind of Sudoku that you just got to line up the right letters in the right box or the right numbers in the right boxes in order to figure out whether or not you're supposed to do X or you're supposed to do Y. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, no, I haven't. Um, He said, well, you know, what if you're wrong? Like, okay, I'm, you're wrong. I'm, then I'm wrong. (laughs) Or no, I'm, I pretty clearly know, like, this is what God is calling me to do. Um, so it was used in that instance for me by someone who had somewhat of a bias of not mm-hmm. wanting me to leave, but also as like a veiled form of skepticism mm-hmm. that I was actually doing the thing that I believed that God was asking me to do. Like, well, mm-hmm. you haven't laid out a fleece, so I'm not sure that you can – that this can be – legitimized by any yeah. like there's this biblical litmus test called Gideon's fleece and if you don't pass if it doesn't pass the litmus test then it's obviously not right the lord's will um and and man I would love to sit down and have a conversation with the pastor that you know preached that message that you remember so vividly because um you know I think that there are Man, what an important message to understand is that not everything that happens in Scripture is an example to be emulated or followed, mm-hmm. right? I once had a pastor say, um, say to me, I think it was one of my seminary professors actually, who said something, and I want to make sure I get this right. He said, um, he said something in, in effect or like, the wording is tricky, so I'm, I'm like making sure I got it right in my head. We don't we don't follow the example of Jesus as Christians. We follow the teaching of Jesus. Mm. Okay, so what does that mean? Because that sounds like a wait a second. We're yeah, not yeah, following yeah. the example of Jesus. That would make some people go what what. Right. Well, I got you. (laughs) Heretic. Yeah, heretic. Right, (laughs) right, right. right, right. But I I think I hear some of the distinction. Yeah. So, like, here's a distinction, Mm -hmm. okay? If What would it mean if we were to only follow that our our litmus test for what we did was the example of what Jesus did in the Gospels? I should probably walk on some water. Walk on some water, right? Um, Or how about this? Do you pay taxes? Mm-hmm. I pay taxes. Pay taxes, yeah. Right? Someone in scripture asked Jesus about the temple tax, which was mm-hmm. their modern day Jewish tax, right? Yeah. And what was what was Jesus' recommendation for paying that tax? How did he how did how did he get the money to pay that tax? Sent the go down to the lake, mm-hmm. throw your fishing line in, catch the fish, look in the mouth of the fish, inside the mouth of the fish is the coin to pay the temple tax. Look on the image, see that it's Caesar. Okay, give it to Caesar. So, like, if I, f- if I, in, a, in, a, in the most strict way, mm-hmm. follow only the example of Jesus, right? Then the way that I'm counting on to pay my taxes is to go over to Chautauqua Lake, go fishing, go fishing, find the money in the mouth of the fish, and go and and go and pay my taxes. And if I don't catch a fish that has money in its mouth, then it's obviously not God's will. Yeah. That I pay my taxes because I'm following the example of what Jesus did. Going fishing, babe. I gotta go go pay my taxes. Right. Like, <laughs> it's tax weekend. So, but rather we follow like the our lives emulate the teaching of Jesus. Go mm-hmm. go love God and and love your neighbors. Yeah. Right. And um and all of the things like you Sermon on the Mount and right. you know all the teaching of Jesus. Mm-hmm. So. So it comes back to the sense of like, all right, does everything that we see in scripture, does it do we do we rip that example out of its context and away from the people that it was meant for mm-hmm. and say, well, this is this is obviously the way right. that we do it now. Yeah. And I just don't think it is. And so to say, like, well, 
yeah, we have to use the same thing that Gideon used. Yeah, why don't we actually lay out literal fleeces? Everybody comes up with something a little bit different. Right. They'll they'll say like, well, I asked God this question in prayer, and then I heard a song on the radio, and that was like a fleece that I laid out. Yeah. Or I heard this message, or you know, a friend called me, or whatever the case may be. And like, neither of us are sitting here saying. God's not going to speak to you through other people. He's not going to speak to you through other yeah. means. He's not going to like have actual practical ways. I think we're talking about the general idea of saying like there's a there's, there's a systematic way in which this should be approached. Right. There's and a if, magical test or a way of getting God to give us the certainty. Right. You know, I, I'll, I'll put one kind of comment out there, and and this is something that. I don't, I don't know where I heard it or, but it's kind of stuck with me is this idea that, you know, when we get really fixated on a, on a, on a choice and we're like, oh, what's, I don't want to, I don't want to mess up God's will. Mm-hmm. It's really presumptive to think that our will can mess up God's will. Mm-hmm. Like just is like little old me is going to thwart what God like absolutely intends to happen. Yeah. Like that's, it's kind of silly. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. You know, like I think God's big enough to handle the decisions we make. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's also big enough to let us make our own decisions and still like hold us. Main, yeah. <laughs> maintain sovereignty. Yeah. You know, it's not like it's it's not denying the sovereignty or the plan of god to say he gives us freedom to make our own decisions and like chart our own paths right um because if the plan of god is for us to be conformed to the image and likeness of his son there's all kinds of times in my life where i have made a decision it has not worked out but i've made it in the in the environment of freedom mm-hmm. right it has not worked out i have failed it has like just fallen flat on my face and then god uses that in order to like really change and do something significant mm-hmm. in me, you know, like the yeah. loss of my mom, for instance, you know, was that God's will? Well, geez, like how do you even begin to answer a question like that? Was it God's will that, you know, my, my mom die? Well, uh, no, but, but like everybody but, dies, but everyone dies. So like, right. Yes, but does God – did God use that in order to like do something in me that is making me more like Jesus? Yeah. Yes. So like, yeah, God is way, 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 way big enough yeah. to not be really even too concerned with mm-hmm. our will thwarting his will. Yeah. I, I will say I'm – we're pastors, right? Mm-hmm. We were just talking about that. And like we interact with thing about spiritual things. We we we're we're supposedly on, you know, mm-hmm. whether or not that's true. We're we you know, we were talking earlier about we're much more like normal people than not, but like yeah. if anybody's going to be like having like an idea of like what to attribute to God's will, you would think it would be people in ministry, pastors. I would think so. Yeah. I'm so, 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 so hesitant to look at something or a situation and say, oh, that was God's will, or God made that happen, mm-hmm. or I'm way more hesitant to do it than a lot of people I run into. Same. People will say, like, oh, God God is punish me, punishing me, mm-hmm. or God made this mm-hmm. happen, or this is God's will. And I'm like, you know what? I, I'm way less presumptive to presume that i know the mind of god yeah i i I, way i'm way more comfortable saying like god remains in control Mm -hmm. in the midst of what has happened god is big enough to redeem circumstances that maybe he didn't want to happen but we chose anyway right right but like it you know in, in in like the worst like we'll take for example like you were just talking about your mother's death like Mm -hmm. How awful, I hope nobody did this, but come up and say, well, you know, it was God's will, Cameron. Oh, no. Many people did it. 
Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And that that's awful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, I think and this is part of the other conversation about God, about like the idea of God's will is that um, there's this interplay between God's will and God's sovereignty and like everything that happens in the world. Mm-hmm. And that everything that happens, everything is God's will. Yeah. Because nothing could possibly happen that God did not will to happen because God is sovereign. Right. Because God is in control of everything. And I think, you know, we could get pretty deep into the weeds on the, you know, philosophical theology here about what is, what, what God's sovereignty really is. Yeah. You know, is because you're not going to, you're, well, maybe you're not, you're, you're not going to disagree. Would you say that God is sovereign over all things? Yeah. Yeah. Hope, Absolutely. Yeah. Mo- like who wouldn't say that God is sovereign right. over all things? But there is, a, I think that there's a difference between God being sovereign over all things mm-hmm. and God, like God creating every single sliver of detail mm-hmm. about life and the thing the the only reason that things happen the way they do is because God is causing them to happen in that exact way mm-hmm. like and I think that I think that the sovereignty of God as I understand it functions a little bit differently than that not not in a sense of like causing everything to happen but certainly um certainly being like um certainly being I, I, not in control but powerful over every right. situation and circumstance yep. um and not causing everything to happen but seeing things seeing things as they happen and maybe a, allowing them to happen by not by not interjecting or intervening in every situation right why well again um because that there is a that there is a that there is the gift of freedom mm-hmm. or love expressed through freedom mm-hmm. um that is to that is given to us and to all humanity yeah. um and so sovereignty the sovereignty of god is not the absolute control yeah of god Mm-hmm. Over every circumstance, in as much as it is um, more about the sovereignty of God, defines God's character and nature, mm-hmm. not His economy in the way that He works. Yes, in the world, exactly. Like I think sometimes we take, well, God is sovereign, and we kind of seem to interpret that into a way of meaning, well, God is the puppeteer that pulls the string mm-hmm. on every. Thing, mm-hmm. I, I think my theology professor. Um, I'm not going to say it exactly how he said it, but it, it was along the gist and kind of synthesizes what I think you just said in saying that the sovereignty of God means that God is capable of doing all things that He will do inside of His character. Mm-hmm. Yes, like it doesn't mean that God is doing all things; mm-hmm. it means He is capable of doing all the things He will choose to do. Yes. And and that shifts from that extreme of God is sovereign, God is the puppeteer that pulls every single string in the universe, to God chooses and is capable of doing all mm-hmm. that he chooses to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that gives us more mystery. Like, the thing is, like, when someone tells me, like, oh, that was God's will or God made that happen, I'm just like... I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe. But it's not me. It's not my job to find out right now. Yeah. It's my job to to be in it and be faithful. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, the last topic, the last question I kind of, I think is worth, I think would be really important for us to talk about before we kind of close this conversation is if we go back a little bit and that decision for you to come back to Chautauqua County and all of that, you were kind of talking about like, this inner conviction, mm-hmm. this like place where you feel like God had actually kind of maybe placed uh, uh, a conviction in your soul 
your heart Mm -hmm. to come back and you were maybe feeling some of the direction of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about that in a like practical sense? Mm -hmm. Because I, I think, I think a lot of times people will come and say like, the Lord told me. And I think to somebody who's maybe newer to the Christian faith or has never experienced anything approximating that is like confused. It's one, it's confusing. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times the language we use around all of that is just unhelpful. Yeah. Because it sounds like you sat down and God like booming voice spoke something to you. Yeah. And I, what I find is that most people who are saying that are like, I feel the Lord had told me this. Mm-hmm. Th- that leaves an ambiguity of like, well, how clearly did he tell you that? How clearly, yeah. How did he tell you that? Was it through a, like, did you like, did he write it on the mirror? Yeah. Like, did, did you hear a booming voice? Yeah. And for people who are like never experiencing that are kind of like, oh, right. what? I, I don't experience that. Let's. Can we talk about that? Sure. I don't. You know. Part of my trepidation with this conversation is that I don't know that I have good practical answers about it. I say there's two points in my life where I have sensed a unambiguous, mm-hmm. without question, like this is. I, I want you to do this mm-hmm. um, from God. The first was my like the to be a pastor, mm-hmm. um, and and that was not like a you know God sat me down in a coffee shop and right. had a long and deep conversation with me. Um, in fact, kind of the form of that was similar. It was similar to the form of like the what I felt like was God's will for me to be back in Chautauqua County. Um, in the form of that original calling, I was a junior in high school. Mm-hmm. It was a summer between my junior and senior year. And I was starting to have those, you know, looking at colleges and wanting to play soccer somewhere. And like, I had my interests and I had the things that like I was good at and not good at. And like, I was looking at schools that had, ministry programs and then I was looking at schools that had good criminal justice programs because mm-hmm. I had a sense of like I'm really interested in criminal justice and this is something I might do um, and then there was one one morning in that summer between my junior and senior year that I woke up like just like normal you just woke, wake up in the morning like to start your day and uh, I'll never forget it um, you know like Moses saw a burning bush I didn't see a burning bush. I just looked up and I remember, I can still remember the shape, the color of my light, the lamp in my room. Mm-hmm. And it's like, as soon as I opened my eyes and saw that, it was like unequivocal, without a doubt, no longer any tension in my soul, no longer any weighing the pros and cons, no longer any questions in my own mind any sense of like, well, I could do this or I could do that. I don't know which one I want to do. Mm -hmm. Like this could be good. This could be bad. All of those ambiguities had been like completely wiped out. And it was a without question, Cameron, I am calling you to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. You are to be a pastor. Um, And I have never, I have, I have never, since that moment doubted or questioned whether or not that was whether or not that was God's like actual God's moving upon my heart Mm -hmm. through his spirit to, to reveal his will to me where I might've had freedom, but, but he, he, he communicated and spoke Mm -hmm. his will. Um, Now there have been times in, in ministry over the last two decades where I have wanted to quit, mm-hmm. where I've wanted to walk away, right? where I've wanted to do something else that would have been much easier, much more enjoyable. But when you begin to look at all of the circumstances and factors of who I am as a person, 
mm-hmm. the, the story of my life, and then begin to like say, all right, like there are things about who I am and how I think and how I communicate and what my gifts are and what my the particulars of my like character are and whatever that like it is re- I see this with humility but it is unquestionable to others that know me well that I would do or be anything else other than a pastor like yes god has created you for this very thing mm-hmm. and so there was a there was kind of a similar a similar like sense of unambiguity about the pathway to come back to Chautauqua County mm-hmm. at that time yeah because I was I was getting ready I was a senior in high school or senior in college um I was gonna enroll in seminary um I knew I was gonna be a pastor I was working in a church as like a ministry director. Um, I had opportunity to stay there and continue to work and do a mm-hmm. good thing, right? Mm-hmm. Work in a church, work in yep. a good ministry yep. under a great senior pastor in a great area. And we had arrangements all made for Sherry and I when we got married. And there was like, and um, I was like, there was this first, I would say that like this internal, there was this internal um, imbalance mm-hmm. where I was, where I could sense in my own spirit and in my own mind that I was r- working really hard to talk myself into staying in Rochester. Mm-hmm. Like that's what you wanted. That's what I wanted. Mm-hmm. Like, oh yeah, man, it's it's just better for us, and like, you know, there's. It's just better, and it's what we want. Like the compulsion that came back here did not make logical internal heart sense. No, mm-hmm. no. So I was like, I was trying to make, I was trying to like make it work, and I was trying to make it mm-hmm. work, and I was trying to make it work, and I was praying to the Lord, like, like let's just can we just make this work, and just make this work, and just make this work, and then there was this in a similar fashion, in a similar fashion to my initial calling into ministry where all the ambiguity was swept out of the way and it became like, this is, no, this is the only thing that I can do. Yeah. This is it. Was like, I remember, I remember my dorm room. I remember, I remember where I was sitting. Mm -hmm. I remember, uh, I remember it all so vividly. I remember the book I was reading. I remember what my pastor had told me. Um, I remember it all so vividly where it was just like, no, Cameron, like, I have a ministry for you where you grew up that, um, like, almost like that, that I've been waiting to give to you for generations. Hmm. Um, and having no idea what that means right. or meant, having no idea how I would get, you know, the steps that I would have to take to get there, having no idea even still right now in this moment. Is this what you meant, Lord? Mm -hmm. Is this what you meant? Mm -hmm. Um, And we could could talk about, like, liking God's will for your life or not, (laughs) or enjoying, you know, the pathway that – that it takes to get there. I, I don't like that's a that's a that's a big conversation. But there was, but suffice it to say, there was an overwhelming internal, um, the spirit of God speaking to me, mm-hmm. um, peace about the path, despite the trepidation of the circumstances. Yeah, you know, like this is not what I want to do. But I have so much peace and internal confirmation, unambiguity about, but this is what I was created to do. Mm -hmm. This is who I was made to be. Mm -hmm. This is where I was meant to go. Yeah. Similar to the way, like, um, I love the way that, 
the way that the, the Bible records God's calling of Abram, who would become Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, the Lord came to Abram and said, I want you to take your, take your household, your wife, your kids, all of your belongings, leave, leave your family of origin, leave everything that you know, leave all of your wealth, leave all of your contacts, leave all of your network. And then he said this, go to the place that I will show you. Where in the hell is that? Mm-hmm. Where is the place that I will show you? Uh. No one knew. Abram didn't know. Right. What he had gotten was a very direct message from the Lord. Mm-hmm. Where you are, what you have is not what I have to you. Get moving. Mm-hmm. Get your feet moving in a direction. Yeah. And I will show you where it is that I'm taking you. Mm-hmm. Um. So... If we were to lay out kind of like a a practical, like a, I think we probably can have a conversation about like what it means to lay out a practical, you know, primer for knowing and doing the yeah. will of God, like right. millions of books have done. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. all over the place. But I don't think that there is any, in fact, I know that there is no substitute for the internal peace yeah. that you receive despite the circumstances of the direction. Yeah. Um, knowing that this is the way that I need to go, even if I don't like I, I don't really want to do that. Yeah. But there is like this like just overwhelming sense of like, but there's no way that I can do anything else. Yeah. Luke, I can't tell you how many times I wanted to be like, I am so done with ministry. I am done. I'm, I'm sick of getting hurt. I'm sick of being insecure. I'm sick of feeling like a failure. I'm sick of my own sin. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of the hours. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. And then I come and it, that lasts for like a, you know, a day or a week or a season or whatever. And I'm like, but what else would I do? Yeah. Not because I can't find a job. Oh, we both could go I, I have go, profitable professions elsewhere. I find a job in five minutes. I, I can make a phone call and have a job. I know it, right? But the, the turmoil of my soul would destroy me. Yeah. Knowing that mm, 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 this is where God would, this is where God has called you. This is what you need to do. This is who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, so, does that kind of answer that? Yeah, question? I mean, I just, I, I think giving some, I don't know. I think there's, there's pre- really only one way to answer that question is by sharing personal experience in kind of a very honest way, without a ton of flowery, like flowery Christian yeah. language. I think yeah. sometimes when we're talking about like. God leading us or God's kind of like, when we get those unique moments of clarity around something that God wants us to do, Mm -hmm. sometimes we over-Christianize them, puts too many confusing words, metaphors around them, that it makes it sound a certain way to people than that, that ultimately is unhelpful. Yeah. I think sometimes a lot of like my guess is that the large, the vast majority of phrases that begin with the Lord told me are better said something like, I feel like it might be wise or I'm getting Mm -hmm. um, a sense or I feel like that's how almost all of those sentences should be said. Yeah, because or. Or we're just always going to walk around presuming to speak for the Lord, yes. which is a extraordinarily dangerous thing to do. Right. And I think there's I, – similarly, like I could describe like my own call to ministry. Mm-hmm. Similarly, I had – maybe I had been kind of serving in ministry in kind of a lay sense, was doing youth ministry and stuff, and was wondering like, is this – I had been for years post high school, like – what am I supposed to do with my life? What do I even want to do? Yeah. And I could I could never settle into anything. 
I could never commit to a thing with like complete abandon. And I went to a conference and I still remember the message, still remember the sermon. And I remember the extreme sense of calling I felt afterwards. And I wrote it down, like mm. exactly what I felt like mm-hmm. God was calling me to do mm-hmm. and I haven't looked back. Yep. It was like, nope, this is it. Like no more like, well, maybes like, nope, this is what I'm supposed to go do. Yep. I think for myself, those moments of it, it, I don't know how to describe it other than that. Like the noise of everything seems to disappear and there seems to be a sense of clarity. Yep. Gotten that very, very rarely about other things, about other things. Yes. Right. Very rarely. Mm -hmm. Like that's not something that happens on a regular basis. Yep. It almost always has to do with something I'm supposed to do. Mm Mm-hmm. That's been my experience. Yeah. I don't have a Bible and verse for that. Yeah. No. Nope. But, you know, I, I can think of the other times where that's maybe happened is like relationships that I knew I needed to invest in. Mm-hmm. Um, that's about, you know, those are the things that come to my mind is like my calling. Yeah. And then general senses about people to invest in or to get to know or. Yeah. But that was it. And immense amount of freedom in in those things as well like yeah i got clarity in my calling and what i was supposed to be doing as a pastor but i didn't get clarity i didn't get that same amount of clarity over where i went to school yep how i pursued it which jobs i took sure like um i know what i'm supposed to be doing like i know the type of ministry i'm supposed to be doing because that was made clear then Mm mm-hmm but there's been an immense amount of freedom in it since then. So I guess I just wanted to kind of like have ourselves talk about that mm-hmm. in a sense and just kind of say that like we didn't hear booming voices. Yeah. No burning bushes. No like the fleece wasn't wet on right. one side. You and know. it's not something that we that happens to us on the daily. No. Mm-mm. And, you know, and to say that maybe there, are, there there's a lesser degree in which there's like – this seems to me with the wisdom and the knowledge that I have to maybe be something that like would be biblically wise Mm -hmm. would be at least somewhat in line of God's will and speak it, but not thus saith the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. I think when people want, if we were to say like, okay, we're pastors, we want to pastor people's hearts. Yeah. We want to shepherd people's hearts. And so I want to be sensitive also to the understanding that, you know, us saying to someone, oh, just, look, well, tell me how it sits with your soul. is not really a practically shepherding, no. helpful answer to the, to that question. I don't know if this thing is God's will for me or not. Um, well, people have peace about awful decisions all the time. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> like, that is not a, I've yes. heard that litmus test a gazillion times. Yeah. Of like, well, I just had a peace about it. Yeah. I'm like, Right. That means zero. Yeah. Jesus did not have peace in the Garden of Gethsemane. No. Like, mm-hmm. that is the opposite of what he yeah, manifested there, an, there. Exactly. He, yeah. um, right, right. So don't don't tell me you have a peace about the sinful decision you just made, and that means it's God's yeah. will. Or even just, not even the sinful, but just the absolutely unwise decision. Right. You know, I got a peace about going, I got a peace about going massively in debt when I don't have a good job. Right. That's not a peace. No. You know, that's, like that's not that's not God's will. It's being oblivious, right? <laughs> but but there is a sense of like so if we if we rewind a little bit and say okay, Pastor, how do I know that this thing whether or not this is God's will for my life? Mm-hmm. There would be a few questions that I would, a few things that I would say to them. The first is examine the thing and and seek to square it, maybe in. Not even maybe, but in in consultation with those in your community of faith whom you trust mm-hmm. um, on whether or not that thing is like – when we talk about God's will is God's word, like mm-hmm. is it a thing that God's word is like – Right. It's not saying – it's at least not saying nay to. Right. It doesn't have to be saying yay to. Right. But it's at least not saying nay exactly. to. Exactly. Right. Not saying nay to. Right. Okay? It's like, okay, there's no like 
There's no biblical referendum against the possibilities here. All right, what's the next step then? I don't see anything in God's word. I think it's the book of James where God says, do any of you, or James says, do any of you lack wisdom? Ask the Lord. You should ask the Lord who gives generously to all without finding fault. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a fancy way of saying, why don't you pray about it? Yeah. You know? And not like, a, this is one of the questions I wanted to ask, but we're getting long and saying like, those who say like, Oh, oh, well, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to pray about whether or not that's God's will or not. Like, I'm going to pray about whether or not to love my neighbor. You don't need to pray about things that are in God's word that is obviously God's will. Just do it. Just do it. Right. But in this situation here, like, yeah, like the, that God is, God is welcoming you into a relationship where Mm -hmm. you, where you earnestly ask him for wisdom about a decision that you need to make or a, direction that you want to go or some place that you need to like move and then pray about it. And I would say like, I would say that you pray about it as long as you need to Mm -hmm. in, in, in either to um, either to get clarity or until there's a deadline Mm -hmm. that you can't take it beyond. Yeah. For instance, you have a job offer on the table. They say you need to respond to the job offer by Friday. You can't say, well, I got to pray about it until I get a piece. And that's going to take me at least till Monday. Yeah. Um, you know? You, you know, this this makes me think of um, an interesting biblical example it, of King David when he prays for, I think, the for the healing or the for one of his children to not die. Mm-hmm. I, I don't remember exactly the circumstances around it. It was like punishment for something or there, there like it was, I, wasn't the sin of Bathsheba. Didn't she? I, I think so. Yeah. That's. Mm-hmm. And so I think it was, and he, mm-hmm. he seeks the Lord like tirelessly yeah. over like, and he mourns and he prays and he's like, Lord, please save. Mm-hmm. Right. And we could, th- this could apply to a, a number of different things here, yeah. but um, child ultimately doesn't get, Saved, I think yeah. the child dies, mm-hmm. and then David picks up and he moves on. Yes, and there, I think there's something too like seeking the Lord earnestly for clarity if we maybe lack it, mm-hmm. but when we don't get it, picking up, picking up and moving on. on. Yeah, like I think, and I think the Lord honors our fasting, our praying, our uh, seeking. Oh my him. gosh, absolutely! Like if we make a decision and we didn't gain any more clarity around it than we began. I, I don't think that we've wasted or prayed in vain Mm-mm. or that like the Lord has failed to show up in any way. No. Like the Lord will honor that in a way that we will be unaware of. Of course. Yes. And, and so like, I, I think sometimes we might put ourselves into a corner and say like, well, I'm going to pray about this because this is a big decision. I feel some weight around it and I want to see if the Lord has anything for me. Mm-hmm. But then if the Lord doesn't show up in a big way, we don't yes. get a big fleece moment. We might be tempted to either just stay immobilized because God hasn't shown up yet. Paralyzed. Yeah. Paralyzed. Or we might contrive something mm. mm-hmm. or attribute something to God that isn't necessarily him. Right. I think there is something to seeking the Lord, the Lord being silent and that being okay. Yes. Yes. Agreed. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so there's the, Biblical referendum. Right. right. There's the, do any of you lack wisdom? Yep. Ask the Lord. He gives generously to all without finding fault. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third that I go to, and kind of all these things kind of happen. They don't necessarily happen in steps. They can. But they can also happen simultaneously to each mm-hmm. other. Is who do you have in your life that is following Jesus, that is in his word? Mm-hmm. That is praying regularly, yep. whose whose life bears the fruit of the Spirit's presence and wise decisions. Ask them. Mm-hmm. There is wisdom in many counselors. Proverbs says, "Yeah, right, yeah." Um, and so, so like, what is the then? What is like just the the wisdom? Yeah. Of other godly women and men in your life yeah. who love you, who have, who have, who don't have a dog in the fight. Yep. You know, 
your yeah. pastor is often a good is they often are. a good person to do mm-hmm. that. Um, well, and a truly wise person will know when to give explicit advice mm-hmm. and when to say, you know what, you kind of just get to choose. Yes, it's very rare where someone's come to me and I've been dogmatically explicit over the option I think that they ought to choose. Same. Same. Yep. Yep. It does happen. There are occasions. Where? Yeah. That's like... Yeah, because... You, you should not do that. Yeah, we go, well, because sometimes what we have to do is go back to the first step of like yep. biblical referendum yeah, and something that they have sped past because they don't want to actually see yeah. that they're not... They shouldn't do this right. thing. Or we draw attention back to it and be like, yeah, no, no, no. Or it's just categorically unwise. Right. Like going into debt when you don't have a job. Right. I'm looking at the situation. This does not look smart. Yes. This does not look like this will bear good fruit. Yeah. But that's, I think, the rare. Very rare. Well, it's not very rare, but it's rare. It's rare. It doesn't happen as much as you would think. Yeah. I think yeah. more often we listen and help people process. Yeah. So yeah, biblical, yes or no. Mm -hmm. Um, Do any of you lack wisdom? You should ask God without finding, who gives to all without finding fault. And then there's wisdom in many counselors. Who do you have in your life that you can run these decisions through? And then at the end of the day, right? Like if all of those things are a wash and you're still like, I don't know. What I take that is, is God being like, hey, you have freedom. Mm -hmm. Choose. I go with you. Go to the land that I will show you. Right? Uh, I will walk with you. Yep. Um, Choose and then release it. And then release it. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think sometimes we get lost. Mm-hmm. We get overly – we feel like it needs to be this overly prescriptive way. But we get paralyzed by – we get paralyzed by thinking that the biblical account is – how it must happen for us. And until there's a burning bush moment, yeah. we're not going to move. Yeah. Which is difficult to say, don't do that because obviously we all talk about like the infallible, inerrant, inspired nature of the word of God, which yeah. we of course believe. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but like we talked about earlier in the podcast, not every circumstance or situation that happened to someone in scripture is a prescription for how it must happen to us. Yeah. So to be careful with that. Yeah. But anyway, we want to, uh, we're going to close up the podcast here mm-hmm. today, but we wanted to remind you that we have a mailbag. We do. Um, and so if there are topics or questions or things that you want to hear us talk about or respond to, um, you can text those mailbag, that, that question, that topic, that video, maybe you want us to both react to it or something yeah. like that. Um, And the phone number for that texting is 716-201-0507. We would love to hear from you. Um, And if you're just starting to listen to this, hey, do us a favor. Would you rate or like or share the podcast? Oh, yeah. Whatever form you're watching it in, if you're on YouTube or Mm -hmm. uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, Help to get it out there. We hope um, that these conversations are helpful for you and that you enjoy a little bit of uncut perspective yeah. from uh, two pastors who are just trying to do ministry well. We do. So, so thanks. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, we'll see you. See you then. See you then.